heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full earnings coverage ahead. We break down results from Salesforce, Snowflake, Paramount, to name but a few. Plus, Bitcoin pushes toward a record high amid massive inflows into exchange-traded funds. We'll get a read on the state of digital currencies amid that rally. And Apple facing weak demand for the iPhone in China as resellers slash the price of the latest model. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout this hour. But first, let's check in on these markets. And it's a macro feel to the day. We get that PCE deflator. Ultimately, what is the inflationary pressure that the Federal Reserve is looking at? Came in bang in line with expectations. 2.8% year on year in terms of inflationary pressure. Right for the Federal Reserve, therefore, to be pausing on any rate cuts. But we hold up about 5 tenths percent on the Nasdaq. Some relief to the market. We're seeing 10-year yields come down down some three, four basis points, in fact, down across the curve. And I'm looking at a volatility index, a fear gauge that shrinks by less than a point. We're at 13 handle. Move it on and have a look at what you were just outlining, though, Ed. Really where the action has been is on the risk asset of choice of the technology show, which is Bitcoin. We're up almost 4%, 62, 63,000, let's call it. Remember, $69,000 is the previous record back in November 2021. What are you looking on the micro? So a lot in the earnings context, but when it comes to tech, Snowflake is the big mover. It's down 18 percent or so in the session, but on track for its biggest drop on record. Two pieces of news, really. Kevin Suitman, the CEO, is stepping down. Uh, he will be replaced by ex-Googler Sridhar Ramaswamy. But also the sales outlook that they gave for the current period, even at the high end of the range, it's like $20 million dollars below what the street was expecting in terms of consensus. And the story for Snowflake was sharp deceleration in growth in 2023. They didn't do enough to say we're on the upward trajectory moving forward into 2024. There's a lot more happening as well in the earnings context, a kind of mixed bag of different companies that we'll get to throughout the show. The first is Paramount. It's actually up 4.8%. Sales declined mid-single digits in the quarter gone. Ad weakness, but they called it. The ad slump is over. We've bottomed out. We're rebounding. We'll talk about it later in the program. HP is now down 1%. It's kind of traded a bit choppy this morning. Look specifically at sales of PCs to consumers. The street expected them to return to growth, but sales fell 1% in that category. It's a concern, even though they're saying 2024 will be better on the customer or, or corporate side. Then Salesforce is actually up 1.5%. Its outlook for the year suggests... Annual growth for full year fiscal 25, 10.8%. I want to go very specific with the numbers, 10.8%. The reason that's important is that they grew just above 11% last year. So in other words, we expect decelerating growth. That's not what the street wanted to hear. But we got our first ever dividend and a buyback. How many times are we going to keep saying that? Mm. Divi, buyback, stocks up 1.5%. And let's dig in, therefore, with an expert who is across all of those numbers, Ed. And you bring us the takeaways. Brody Ford was there with a closer look at some of these results. And, Brody, there does seem to be this worry about the forecast front and centre. Yeah, everybody wants more growth. There's no question. With Snowflake in particular, they're always an interesting one because unlike a lot of these software companies that charge you five, ten-year contracts so you can predict it pretty well, they charge you based on how much you use the product, kind of like uh, AWS or an Azure, which means every earnings, it's a little volatile. We're not sure what we're gonna get. And so this forecast, it made people feel anxious because it showed that growth continued to decelerate. You mix that with losing one of the most famous CEOs in the industry, that's gonna be a shakeup. Okay, let's talk about Salesforce. Um, this is. I, I just go so nerdy on the details. I use MODL on the Bloomberg terminal, and we're talking about a few basis points. But my understanding, Brody, and you and I were talking about this on the phone, is where do we find the AI read through? We didn't. You know, they outperformed in the quarter gone to end 2024, fiscal 24, with like 11.2% growth, and they're guiding us to 10.8% growth this year. What is or what is not happening for Salesforce right now? Yeah, and it's funny because they are guiding to that above 10% number when it comes to the non-consulting revenue. When it comes to top line, 
their forecast has slipped below that psychological 10% mark, which, you know, all of a sudden then you become a value stock rather than a growth stock. Salesforce, the story they're telling is that AI is going to buffet the need for a lot of their solutions. The early stage one will be in their data products, data cloud, warehousing, Tableau for analytics, and that did outperform, right? I mean, they are seeing uptick there. They say it's the highest organic growth of any product they've had. But still, I think the AI impact on these numbers is relatively low. And I think that's the case for a lot of these application software makers. They want to tell an AI story, but in reality, it's still very early days. It is hard to quantify the exact impact at this point, even if in the earnings call, you're going to hear those two letters over and over again. <laughs> we certainly are. Brody Ford, we thank you so much for bringing us the inside track on both Snowflake Salesforce. Let's dig in with both those companies and the broader ecosystem right now. We're pleased to welcome Rebecca Wedderman, CEO and Principal of Valois, a technology analyst firm providing research advisory services to leaders with a focus on the value of technology. So talk to us about the value proposition at Salesforce right now, from your perspective, Rebecca, are they offering the right kind of offerings at the right price point with the right focus on margin? Sure, Caroline. Thanks for thanks for having me today. So Salesforce uh, got the timing right with Data Cloud, right? Just as everyone recognizes that data and metadata is actually what makes AI work, they've got Data Cloud out in production. And they're doing a lot today from a penetration perspective, offering credits to customers to get out there and start to adopt Data Cloud so they can start to experience uh, the benefits of AI. Salesforce has some runway in other areas as well. And I think what we've seen, too, in the past years, they've pushed to um, improve efficiency and improve margins is offerings like the AWS marketplace and other more self-service things that should help them keep their cost of sales under control as well. It's interesting whenever I hear, for example, marketing coming my way from a Salesforce, it's always about the safety, the using of your own proprietary data here. And that seems to be the sale from Snowflake, too. But sticking with Salesforce, ultimately, what, what's your view on whether the incumbents win in this space, the fact that they've already got the deals with so many of these corporates, that they're going to be the ones that win out these AI offerings, or whether these challenges that are coming up and being VC-backed can make some big inroads. You know, it's interesting that you asked that, Caroline, because we just did a study asking people about whom they would trust with their AI. And what we found is that it wasn't necessarily those established vendors. Buyers were more likely to trust AI solutions that came back from organizations that had traceable data and clear ethics and privacy policies, not necessarily an established vendor. So there's still a lot of room for innovators out there. This is how I think about AI and Salesforce, right? AI means they can charge more. They're more expensive premium <laughs> products. It adds value to what they already do. That did not show up in their numbers. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that, but I think too what we're seeing is a penetration strategy for data cloud today as customers need to make that leap into it. So you see with the new marketing cloud offering where they get data cloud credits. They're going to work on building that up in true Salesforce fashion, get them to try and get excited about it and then really be able to turn on the switch. Oh, we know all about true Salesforce fashion, um, but here's the reality. There's a company that grew mid 20% range every year for a decade and it's going the wrong way. Snowflake had a sharp deceleration in its growth last year. It's not giving us evidence that it's turning around. What's your conclusion on the corporate enterprise spending environment based on the results that those companies gave? Well, I think Snowflake made it pretty clear when they said this is recovery, not rebound. Uh, we're looking at a new era in, in correcting on the software space. I do think Salesforce has some runway with its other products like Slack. There's still a big revenue opportunity there that they haven't quite tapped. Okay, so we have a change of leadership at Snowflake. Does that excite you? The market never likes a surprise change in CEOs, right? But I think too, Frank was brought in to grow at a certain point, just like he did with ServiceNow. Uh, Schreeder is a different person. And as we look at Snowflake moving from just cloud storage to more of an AI company, certainly Schreeder has the, the chops and the experience that make him a good person in that spot. 
All right, CEO and Principal of Valois, Rebecca Wedderman, great to have you on the program. Really good wide range of analysis on many different companies. Coming up on the program, we're going to switch from the equity markets to Bitcoin, risk asset of choice, and crypto markets more broadly. We're going to discuss all of that and more with Framework Ventures' Vance Spencer. That's next. But there are other stocks on the move, Caro. There are, and there are more earnings to come. If you thought it was all over, uh-uh, after the bell, we're going to be looking at what Dell has to report. We're up seven-tenths of a percent ahead of those numbers. Hewlett Packard, of course, we've got the focus on HPE. We've already had HP as you were running us through at the start of the show, currently up 1.8%, and I understand the CEO will be joining the network tomorrow. Now, Soundhound AI, another darling in the AI spice, up 220%. So far this year, we're up another seven percent. Can this company deliver the exuberance that we see factored into the share price? From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Let's check on other risk assets today because they are higher, decidedly so. We are on a tear when it comes to crypto. Could we be eyeing the $69,000 handle that we had previously at record numbers for Bitcoin? Currently trading up at 63000 as you'll see, but it's not just Bitcoin getting the love. It's being spread through some of the other areas. So we're seeing Ethereum up significantly, up 2.3 on the day. But we're hitting a 3465 And other layer one protocols, I think of Solana, also doing particularly well. Look at that, up more than 11% on the day. There is much love more broadly in the crypto space. Fear. Look at what's happening in the equity side of the equation, though, as well, because as some of these underlying assets do well, well, if you're holding or if you're mining, they're doing particularly well for you as well. I mean, we know key hodler in chief in the equity market is, of course, MicroStrategy, and they're up 3.3%. Now, interestingly, on the downside have been Marathon. Now, this is on the back of their numbers, many worrying about the accounting practices and ultimately whether or not they're just showing an uplift to their overall earnings because they're able to show the current increase in value of the underlying holdings of Bitcoin. It's up some 15% as some analysts felt that the numbers didn't hit their mark. And remember, these stocks have run up in recent weeks and months. We're looking also at Riot Platforms on the downside by more than 9%, probably in sympathy with the other miner that is Marathon. But it's notable that at the moment, Ed, there is this supply-demand dynamic that just seems to be working in Bitcoin in particular's favour. All right, let's keep digging into everything crypto and bring in Van Spencer, co-founder of the Web3-focused venture firm Framework Ventures, $1.4 in assets under management. You know, Caro summed it up really nicely. First of all, we've moved slightly beyond just Bitcoin to a kind of broader positivity in, in, in digital assets. Um, and then the supply-demand equation. Just give me a health check right now of how you feel general sentiment is towards cryptocurrencies. Extremely positive, to say the least. I mean, if you think about the nine Bitcoin ETFs that are active right now, they're on pace to buy about a million Bitcoin per year. And I have it up on my other screen, but there's about 1.9 million Bitcoin total on all of the exchanges worldwide. And so, so something's got to give. And, and this is what's different in this cycle versus the previous cycles where, you know, we didn't have Larry Fink buying 85,000 Bitcoin in the last 20 trading days. Um, and so these ETFs are a watershed moment. They're 11 years in the making. That was when the first application was filed. And we've got ETH up next. It's a, it's a May 29th approval or, or denial date. We think it will be approved. It's basically the same case. Um, and it's a much smaller, much more reflexive asset. And the last thing I'll say is that there's a ton of work that's happened since you know the, uh, the big crash that happened in 2022. We've got DeFi really firing, starting to produce earnings. We've got gaming starting to bring in a lot of people. The ecosystem is extremely coherent. It's kind of hard to fade just all of the work that's happened. So I feel good. It, it, you take on the face of it just the movement in Bitcoin, but one of the things we've been talking about this week is the offshoots, right, to other, uh, let's call them asset classes, but take NFTs. You look at the data for NFT volume in December, really close correlation with Bitcoin. The reason I'm glad to have you on the show, Vance, is to me, it seems like a lot of that is related to what's happening in gaming, an area that your firm is really focused on. I mean, Gaming is probably the most positive story in crypto right now. And it's a story that's, again, been years in the making. But all the games that were funded in that 2021, 2022 run have just started to launch. And, and one in particular, Pixels, has about 400,000 daily active wallets. That's the biggest blockchain application by far right now in terms of user count. 
And so we're moving kind of beyond this prosumer, you know, whale driven crypto economy into something that's more mass market. And, you know, people have been waiting for that adoption moment. And I think it's coming. I, th I think it might already be here. And so you've got all these different narratives really firing the ETFs, gaming, DeFi, ETH. Um, what's the bear case? I mean, maybe the ETF inflows stop, but the vast majority of RIAs have not been able to allocate to these yet. And the numbers that we hear are one to three percent. That's what Fidelity says, you know, of the portfolio that you should have in crypto. That equates to about one hundred and fifty billion dollars coming into this space over the next couple of years. And, you know, we're one of the larger asset managers in crypto framework is and and we've had the pleasure of buying, you know, mid nine figures of crypto over the past two years in liquid right. markets. And th this might sound strange, but it's it's actually hard to get the coins. Um, these markets are not as liquid as people think. And, and so. I think the open question is kind of what happens when that money comes in. Um, it could get, you know, wilder than people think, is my guess. Uh, I remember reading about you guys 2022. Hannah Miller was writing about how you were raising money at a time where everyone was raising money. You know, that was happening. It did not happen in 2023. Where are you focused now in, in the deploying of capital and your, your kind of appetite to raise more funds? Uh, I don't know how much I can or cannot say about you know our raising plans. It's my just plans. you and I on the show. Just just yeah, just no, give us just the me, details, yeah. Vance. Yeah. Um, look, we raised four hundred million two weeks before Luna collapsed, and so you can imagine what that was like. Um, and we spent that year buying. You know, we called a lot of the capital in that fund, and you know, really nobody wanted to talk to us when we were buying ETH at a thousand. But at thirty five hundred, people have now turned around and. You know, all the LPs are excited and, and there's a lot more interest in this space. But let me put it in perspective for you. I was at a pension fund conference this week. It was a two day multi strategy, multi asset class pension fund conference. The crypto people got one panel at 830 in the morning. And, you know, there's a ton of interest, but the pension funds and the largest endowments in the world are still behind on this stuff. And, and I do think in the fullness of time, when you look back and you think about what it might mean to miss the birth of an asset class, especially into an ETF style paradigm, a lot of those people are going to be you know, pretty upset and wondering what happened. So I think we're early. All right, Framework Ventures co-founder Van Spencer, really appreciate having you on the show. I'm glad there were some things you could say uh, here on Bloomberg <laughs> Technology. Caro, what do you got? Teasing it out of him, Ed. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to go back to the publicly traded companies. Paramount out with earnings, reporting streaming revenue that beat expectations. We're going to break down, though, what the overall revenues and ad market was looking like for this company, and ultimately, it's still not looking that pretty. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Time for talking tech. First up, Electronic Arts said yesterday that it would be cutting 5% of its workforce, that's about 670 people, due to shifting customer needs and a refocusing of the company. It will also be halting development on a number of undisclosed titles and pulling back on its real estate holdings. CEO Andrew Wilson told staff in a memo that the company would be, quote, moving away from development of future licensed IP that we do not believe will be successful in our changing industry. EA joined Sony, Microsoft, Tencent, Riot Games and other top studios in laying off employees as game development costs increase. And Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange, said it recovered $4.4 billion worth of digital assets for its users who mishandled their deposits within the past two years. Users can mishandle their funds in a variety of ways, including entering incorrect wallet addresses, depositing incompatible tokens and problems from blockchain upgrades. That's according to Thursday's report. The cryptocurrency exchange said it resolved more than 381,000 cases of cryptocurrency that was deposited deposited by users but not credited in 2022 and 2023. Plus, Alibaba is rolling out its second major price cut 
for cloud services in years, hoping to win back users from rivals like Tencent competing to provide tools critical to training AI. The Chinese internet pioneer will slash prices starting Thursday on scores of internet-based services by as much as 55% or 20% on average. The cuts represent one of the more aggressive moves by the company to stay ahead of Tencent and Baidu in the cloud business and risk triggering a price war in what's already a hotly contested sector out in China. Caro, what are you looking at? Well, I'm talking of contested sectors and ones that well, might be feeling the heat. Let's talk about streaming and focus in on Paramount. Shares, as you see, actually a bit of a reprieve today, up 3.3% after revenue for its direct-to-consumer streaming business, Paramount Plus, beat expectations. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Geetha Ranganathan joins us now for more on the results. And, well, there was some optimism really showing there, but ultimately the revenues, the ad side, still a cloud here. Yeah, absolutely, Caroline. So, uh, you know, you're right in terms of the DTC business, which is the streaming business, there were some green shoots there. I think overall what we came off with was there are some tones of, you know, stabilization in Paramount's results. I'm just not sure that it's going to be enough. You, you know, you do have the linear TV business, which brings in about 55% uh, of the revenue for the whole company, almost 90% of its profits, though. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of focus there. And that sector has just been so challenged just with cord cutting and kind of this whole movement to, to streaming and, you know, the movement of eyeballs from uh, linear TV networks to, to all of the digital platforms. And so obviously the advertising dollars also moving away. So that market has been under a lot of stress. So TV ads were down 15%. You know, Paramount Paramount will get the benefit in the first quarter with the Super Bowl. There will be, you know, some lingering benefits throughout the year with the political ad cycle, but that's not going to be enough because, you know, the core advert advertising trends remain very, very challenged. And so, yeah, that was definitely kind of that remains a pain point. But I think yeah. the bright spot is that, you know, the, the streaming metrics definitely look good. There's a lot going on in the background with Paramount, Gita, and, and for me, it always comes back to the loss in the streaming business was more narrow than expected, but we don't have any better sense on how Paramount does anything organically or inorganically to make that business profitable. So they did articulate a strategy, and this was, you know, this was, I think, one of the things that investors are kind of cheering uh, a little bit this morning because they said that they are hoping to get to Paramount uh, Plus profitability, domestic profitability by 2025. Now that's the first time that they've actually given us a, a time frame. Yes, losses have narrowed. They do seem to have some plans in place for cutting down costs, for kind of optimizing content costs across the board, both their linear TV networks as well as streaming. Again, I'm not sure that's enough to move the needle. We did see last week Warner Brothers Discovery actually posting a, a modest profit in its streaming business, but investors are still very, very skeptical that the profits on the streaming side can actually completely offset the losses on the, on the linear TV side. Cutting your way to profit, Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Gita Ranganathan, great to have you on the program. Now, coming up on the show, the maker of Grand Theft Auto is calling for all of its employees to return to the office for five days a week starting in April. Rockstar Games, we're going to discuss that next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get a quick check on these markets, Ed, because today the PCE number, that favoured view of inflationary pressures from the Federal Reserve, was posted at 8.30 a.m. and it was a relief. It came in where expectations were, 2.8% year-on-year growth in terms of inflationary pressure, the Fed seeming right to be pausing on any cuts. But that sort of relief that it came in as expected means that tech stocks push higher, up four tenths of percent. Ten-year yield comes down some three basis points. But actually, sort of moving aside from any of the macro data points of late, 
Bitcoin has been on its own roll over the last few trading days and weeks, as you know. We're currently up 62,215, so clearly really trying to eye that new record high as supply-demand dynamics continue. We'll dig into that in a moment with one of our VC guests. We're up 2.8%. Move on and have a look at some of the individual movers because earnings have come thick and fast. A lot for some of these software AI plays that I want to shine a light on. Okta, massive move, up some 20%. Now, this company's been under duress. Remember, a breach that happened recently. Now, the numbers that came in from Okta seem to give analysts some reprieve. They seem to be liking the fact that they're managing to upscale where they think the price point for this particular company is going and subscriptions were sort of a relief over over there. Duolingo up 22%. Absolutely rampant growth that we're seeing at the moment in terms of revenues driving higher, people wanting to be learning the languages on this particular AI-enabled platform. Maybe the Super Bowl advert did a little bit as well. We're looking at C3 AI, 24% higher. This also a relief because many had thought that maybe this had just been an AI hype cycle. C3 AI needed to prove that its subscription growth was really there. And it is. And many an analyst, therefore, upgrading on the back of these numbers as well. So some big moves in some of these software and AI plays today, Ed. All right, we have some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal and a red headline in the video games industry. Swedish video games outfit Embracer is going to sell its Sabre subsidiary in a deal valued at around 500 million US dollars. That, according to a Bloomberg source. Uh, let's bring in the reporter that just broke that story for Bloomberg, Jason Schreier. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm familiar with the names because I'm a longtime fan and player of Knights of the Old Republic, the Star Wars game. I used to play on PC, the OG in the second version. Tell us about the deal you're reporting on. Yeah, so uh, it's happening as we speak. So this is going to be announced in a... Uh, in the next week or two, that Embracer Group is selling essentially Sabre, which is a big subsidiary of Embracer Group, is going to go private. So a little bit of context here. Embracer Group is the Swedish gaming conglomerate that made a lot of headlines a couple of years ago because it was buying up companies all across the video game industry. A huge spending spree back in the, the hal halcyon days of 2021 when the interest rates were low and buying was easy. But of course, things have changed. And Embracer Group has since embarked on a cost-cutting initiative that has led to carnage across the video game industry. It has shut down studios, laid people off, and now it's just looking to shed costs whenever possible. This is the latest move on that front. And overall, when you see these cancellation of projects, when you see ultimately companies doing deals like this, does it speak to some of the pressure points that we're seeing across the entire industry? It definitely does. And yes, just this year, this week alone, I mean, we've just seen it's been a bloodbath. Sony has laid off 900 people. EA just said last night it was laying off more than 600 people. Yeah, we're seeing a climate. A lot of it, there are a few factors behind all of these layoffs. But I think the biggest one is that during the pandemic, when there was a lot of growth in the video game industry, a lot of these companies just swelled, they bloated, they hired too many people. And now they are kind of, they're, they're facing the math. They are looking at the numbers. The numbers have gone down a little bit. The growth hasn't been quite what it was when everybody was stuck at home playing video games, but uh, the overhiring is still there. And uh, as always happens, the people who actually made those decisions that are, are sticking around, it's the people who got hired who are suffering as a result of this. Uh, Jason, the other top, top story that our audience is following is Rockstar Games, the studio behind Grand Theft Auto, uh, telling its employees, according to your reporting, to come back to the office five days a week, starting in April. What do you know about the decisions behind that move? Yeah, it's interesting. I think that in a lot of industries, a lot of industries obviously are grappling with this question of returning to the office after uh, employees have gotten used to either working hybrid or working remotely. Um, with the gaming industry, it's kind of, it plays off on the topic we were just talking about because the volatility of the video game industry is such that uh, people have to uproot their lives constantly for new jobs. And so remote work is, is very much a shield against that volatility. And so for a company like Rockstar, which is one of the leading video game developers, to come out and say, hey, we need you all to come in five days a week, um, really strikes kind of, it's a big contrast between what we're seeing elsewhere. Um, yeah, Rockstar, their, they, their rationale here, it's largely because of security. And so they've suffered from some huge leaks of the next Grand Theft Auto game. There was one in 2022 where a bunch of footage, early footage from the game got leaked and dropped on the internet. And then last year, uh, last December, just a couple months ago, when they were planning on releasing their latest, their new trailer, 
trailer, their first trailer for GTA 6. Um, it was actually leaked on Twitter uh, a few hours before it was due to go up. Uh, it was it was pretty ridiculous, actually. It was leaked with like a giant Chiron in the middle saying, buy Bitcoin. It was very, very bizarre sequence of events. The game was the game is set in Florida. I joked at the time that it's the most Florida thing ever for the game to leak in that fashion. But this is this is one of the main reasons that they're doing this return to office, because they believe that their security was compromised as a result of people working remotely. What's interesting, though, is we've seen it at other tech companies, I think of Grindr, who said, look, come back to the office, and it actually helps them reduce their workforce with a more of a natural attrition version, because they're like, look, if you're not going to abide by some of our rules, you need not come back. Is that kind of what's playing into this as well, Jason, even though they are playing up the security side? That is extremely an extremely common theory, I will say, and I've heard that not just attached to Rockstar, but also to a bunch of other companies. Blizzard last year was big on on return to office, and one of the theories was, hey, is this just kind of a soft layoff? Is this a way that we can lay people off without actually laying people off? Because we know that X percent of people will leave uh, when they're forced with the, the prospect of having to go back to the office five days a week. So very common theory. Uh, I don't have anything that can prove that, but it's certainly logical. Jason Shire, brilliant to have you across what is a very talked of industry group today across all of the different companies moving and shaking. We thank you so much. Meanwhile, let's turn to Apple for a moment because, well, there's not some great price point action happening over in China. Resellers slashing the price of the iPhone 15 models get this by as much as $180. And it all seems to signal that we've got an unusually prolonged slump in demand. And Ed, this is more than we're used to. What took my attention was that actually some of this is dressed up as, well, deals to be made before International Women's Day. I haven't seen many deals being made my way for International Women's Day next week for objects to be cheaper than usual. But the fact that $180 does seem to be more than we usually see at this time of year in the lunar holidays. Yeah, there, there are different data sets that you can point to and try and draw a conclusion. The main one that, that Bloomberg focuses on in the story, Caro, is that iPhone 15 sales are just not doing as well as prior generations, the iPhone 14 in China. So on Alibaba's Tmall, you can get a $180 discount. But the difference this time around, this year, more domestic pressure, right? Yeah. The handset from Huawei, uh, you know, in the marketplace. And those headwinds just continue. I mean, we talk about some of the geopolitical tensions that have affected, of course, the supply side chain of Apple and more broadly, demand too. We've got to think that there's been this government, not perhaps... The PR around it has been difficult to find the nuance, yep. but ultimately, governments or uh, government affiliated companies not wanting you to bring in your Apple phone, wanting you to buy local, and Huawei, of course, bringing out this incredibly powerful rival. The conclusion that Bloomberg intelligence analysts reach it implies weakness in China. Um, okay, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, how New York City might be poised to be the next major AI hub. That's according to Lux Capital. We're going to discuss with partner. Grace Isford, that's next. Caro, what's happening in the markets? Well, just going back to Apple for a moment, because this is a European-related company, a Swiss chip maker, in fact, absolutely plunging, as you can see, in European trading. After a major customer, now analysts believe this customer to be Apple, Ed, cancelled the chip maker's key project around micro LEDs. So, as this is a result, impediment charges of up to 900 million euros. You can see the impact on that two-day chart. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Well, you just saw that Mike Novogratz is going to be on Bloomberg in a little while. And, well, that's because we're talking about crypto a lot at the moment. Bitcoin, of course, having quite the tear, 42% on the nose over the last trading days of 30 days. And this, of course, as we see demand supply ultimate imbalance as we start to see the ETFs come to bear and more notably some of the talk of halving happening in April. Someone who basically is at the intersection of everything we're talking about at the moment, whether it's the nexus of Web3, also of data infrastructure, of AI, ML, is Lux Capital partner Grace Isford, who joins us now for VC Spotlight. And what's so interesting is you were sort of very highly focused on what now seems to be all of our talking points at the moment, when you first came to Lux in 2022, having been at Canvas before that. What are you making of the ecosystem in crypto when you're looking at putting VC dollars to work? Because yes, we can all think of it as some sort of asset that we can track and, and bet upon and speculate. But what is the underlying building of infrastructure looking like right now? 
Ironically, it's the same building blocks for both. You know, who are the innovative technologists who are taking, you know, cutting edge foundational principles, whether it's in cryptography or whether it's in applied machine learning, and taking that to solve a real problem for the end users. So both the B2B infrastructure on the crypto side and the B2B infrastructure on the AI side, we continue to see a lot of exciting innovation. Okay, well, let's talk about the practical innovations that are being built maybe here. You've just been to San Francisco. There's a lot of talk, actually, of how cryptography can be an answer to compute and access to compute when we are thinking of large language models and, and machine learning. Is that something you're seeing being solved for at the moment in both places? Well, certainly. Actually, take our Lux portfolio company, Together AI. We actually led the seed in that company. They're based in San Francisco, but their chief scientist, Sri Dow, he's actually moving to New York to be an assistant professor at Princeton. I'd love to talk a little bit more about the New York theme there. But they are actually having decentralized compute in many ways versus using a centralized cloud provider in order to power that AI infrastructure stack. Uh, Grace, let's have a little bit of healthy competition between cities, shall we? Uh, this week, we, we published a documentary called Welcome to Cerebral Valley. And as you know, like right now, the lion's share of, of dollar or intellectual capital is here. But New York is growing, um, both on the personnel side and attracting more dollars. What is Lux Capital's attitude towards that? The AI demand is unprecedented, both in San Francisco and New York, and I think you're going to see continued growth in both cities, right? SF will continue to be a hub. New York is a really exciting and growing hub, both because of the demand we have here. 44 of Fortune 500 companies are headquartered right here in New York. There was a recent unicorn report where the number of unicorns in New York rose from 3 to 100 over the last 10 years. And you're seeing huge industries here, whether it's financial services or media. As it pertains to New York specifically, there's a great talent bed here. I just mentioned Tree Dow from Together. He actually is moving here to New York. We've also seen several other great AI labs, world class, right here in New York. NYU, Jan LeCun, he's the chief medicine, uh, scientist at Meta. He's also here in New York. Uh, and the Princeton and Columbia and Cornell Labs are, are bustling. One of the surprising headlines that caught my eye in the last couple of days was Jamie Dimon, of all people, saying that mayors in Texas will phone him up and say, what can we do to get more business? But you know, officials in New York City, according to Jamie Dimon, are not as business friendly. What is your kind of boots on the ground experience of that from kind of a host city perspective? I've been seeing bustling innovation and I've been seeing a lot of people choosing to live in New York because they want to live here and going through whatever hoops they need to do to, to build an awesome company here. So whether that's getting great talent out of major tech companies, whether that's getting a lot of new grads, we saw a 6x increase in applicants according to a recent handshake report over the last five years wanting to move here. And we see a lot of international talent, right? Folks coming from Europe, folks coming from Israel, all moving right here to New York City. What often will be said to some of the VCs that I speak to, I was chatting with Able Partners, for example, yesterday, is that the, what New York has going for it, even if it's not comparable in terms of the sheer scale of money being raised quite yet or deployed here, is diversity. And we have different industry groups here. It's interesting that a lot of the companies that you're backing seem to be in image generation, seem to be in sort of the, the advertising, creative space. I think of Runway, for example. Well, Runway, right based here in New York, Lux partnered and led the series Seed in that company. They are working hand in hand with filmmakers and with producers right in their offices in New York City. And so they're working not just to you know, add AI as a side thing to their workflows, but integrate it directly into the workflow. And they've seen a lot of success with that, working with both Fortune 500 companies and those filmmakers in production. And I'm pretty sure a little bit of healthy nervousness coming from those industry groups that are seeing themselves being, well, and many would say disrupted by the pace of AI. Grace Isford, it's so great to have her on, just on the nexus of everything that's happening in our world at the moment, Lux Capital Partner. And we're talking actually about, well, another portfolio company of theirs right now. Yeah, hugging face. And actually, as a reminder, the big story we've been tracking this week is the fallout from Gemini, Alphabet or Google's a generative AI text and image generating tool uh, that has come in for criticism and elicited a response from Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, who called some of the deficiencies unacceptable. Let's bring in Hugging Face researcher and chief ethics scientist, Margaret Mitchell. Margaret, you have your own history with, uh, with the academic body of Google that we can get into. But yeah, that's right. We're showing Sundar Pichai's statement right now about what happened with Gemini. The reason we really want to get you on the show is, can this be fixed, technologically yeah. speaking, in the short yeah. term? 
Yeah, it actually can. So there's a few different approaches to handling the different ways that people are going to be using these systems. And one is to have a bunch of different models under the hood that end up figuring out what different users' intent is um, and providing different kinds of responses based on what the user intent is. So it should be fixable. Um, I'm a little surprised it's taking so long, but I guess we'll see. Uh what I'm trying to reconcile in my mind is that Google is at the origin story of artificial intelligence, the body of R&D or academic work that, that happened yeah. more than a decade ago. How do we get to this point where they publish a tool where yeah. the, there is clear evidence that the model has some, some deficiencies and, and evidence of yeah. biases? Yeah, I mean, we've seen Google uh, laying off a lot of people, um, lay, laying off people who are experts in uh, AI ethics, which really helps with the kinds of issues that they're seeing now. Um, I think that Google might be playing a bit of catch up, um, sort of trying to release things perhaps before they're fully ready, um, and also not necessarily having the right people at the table to, to make the decisions. Um, so Google's in a very different position than it was, you know, 20 years ago. It's worth saying what side of the table you're coming from and your history with Google, because, of course, you, you co-led Google's ethical AI team. You stepped down from that group. You're pri previously, of course, over at Microsoft. I mean, you've been everywhere. You've moved over to Hugging Face to really drive the ethical perspective at that particular part of the business. But I'm interested as to the lackings, the failings that you saw a couple of years ago that, that drew your criticism and ultimately as you left Google. Is that what's at Edge here, when I think about the, some of the issues that you say as to why this isn't getting fixed as quickly, it seems to be, from yeah. you, your perspective, a question of personnel here and who's got the power to make decisions. Right. Right, yeah, it's completely an issue of, of who's at the table. I mean, one of the things that so many uh, women and people of color speak to in the AI ethics world is the need to think about how technology is going to be used, how it impacts different people, and we're really not seeing that kind of consideration in the way that these technologies are being unrolled. Um, so it really seems to be that there isn't enough clear thinking about foresight, about context of use, about the social impact. Um, and these are things that a lot of people who specialize in, in things like AI ethics, responsible AI, m many of whom are un underrepresented in technology, um, you know, we're not, we're not seeing this kind of insight, which means that there might not be the right people and the people there might be more disempowered than they should be. And the model that this is then unleashed upon is in an environment of a culture war, as some might call it, Margaret. I'm interested, though, what, for me as a consumer, could be made clearer? How can prompt transformation, how can me understanding what's going on under the hood be better served to me so I understand where I perhaps can show my preferences, my needs, yeah. my, my choices when it comes to the images being generated? Right. Right. So one thing that actually uh, people are familiar with, with Google image search, is when you type in some sort of query, some prompt to get a set of images, um, there, there's a bunch of different boxes you can select from that get at different things you might use. Um, in the past, Google has actually been very good at this, trying to give users an option um, to specify the kinds of intents that they have in, in what they're trying to search for, and then further refining based on that. Um, so, so that technology is there. It's something that Google actually has a history of developing and developing well. Um, this same kind of approach could be put into any sort of chatbot system, be it more generative or not, uh, where users are shown a, a, a selection that they can um, choose among to get at the kinds of things that they would like. There's also the possibility to have a back and forth in order um, for the system to ask the user for a little bit more specificity. Users could potentially set preferences. And the system could also show a variety of different things, um, regardless of different boxes users might, might check. Um, they could say, here's a historical image, here's the world as it could be, you know, let me know more about what you'd like to see. Practical takeaways, we really appreciate you for it. Margaret Mitchell of Hugging Face, of course, she was previously founder and co-led Google's ethical AI group. Coming up, we stick with the artificial intelligence amid reports the SEC has opened an investigation into whether OpenAI misled investors. Details to come. This is Bloomberg Technology. The SEC 
Well, it's investigating whether OpenAI investors were misled as the startup went through a ferocious debate over leadership last year. This is all being reported by the Wall Street Journal, citing people familiar with the probe. Now, the Securities and Exchange Commission is studying internal communications by CEO Sam Altman in relation to his ouster, the report said. Now, the SEC has sent a subpoena to the company in December and asked senior OpenAI officials to preserve internal documents. Now, to regain his job, remember, Ed, Altman agreed to an internal investigation, among other conditions, and we yet to see the outcome. Yeah, we await the outcome. There are the private investors in a complex cap table. And then there are the Microsoft investors, because remember, in the public markets, Microsoft shares reacted to the chaos, which you and I both lived through. <laughs> Feels an age away. But of course, the still debate rages on. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Uh, big thanks to everyone who listens to the podcast. We know there are a lot of you out there. We're on Spotify, iHeart, Apple and the Bloomberg platforms. Gosh, what a week it's been. From San Francisco in New York City, this is Bloomberg Technology.